Hello and welcome. So um, my name is Guillaume Debauché. Um, as you know, I'm the CEO of Airline Selection Program and today we're going to uh, talk about low-cost Irish airlines. As you know, uh, we've created a, uh, a specific course uh, that's called How to Pass the Low-Cost Irish Airline Selections. So that's what we are going to talk about today. Uh, we are going to detail the course and we are going to give you lots of tips um, over and above what's in the course to really help you out if you've got such a selection coming uh, in the next few days uh, or in the next few months, right. So the low-cost Irish airline selections are quite special, they are, they are quite specific, they are in interesting because uh, it's a hybrid type interview, we will discuss that, so there's a lot to talk about. I'm excited that you're here and uh, if you're watching this video on YouTube right now, I'm sure you will get a lot of benefit from it. And so let's, uh, let's get started. Good, so what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the low-cost Irish airline assessment overview. Uh, what can you expect on the day over there? Uh, then we'll talk about the, what is the hybrid interview. And so if you already are an advanced interview course um, version 2 client, you know what that is. But today, even if you're not a client, you're going to find out what that's all about. We're going to talk about the SIM exercise, which is all important over there. And uh, we're going to talk about what you can expect on the day and how to best prepare for the SIM exercise. Then we're going to talk about the free course and what it contains. Of course, uh, if you don't have the free course just yet, just go on our website. You go to online.airlineselectionprogram.com and you will see in the free section there is a low-cost Irish airline free course. Just go ahead and get it. And you will get every two days some content, an ebook, some fact sheets, and uh, you will get uh, quite a lot of very, you know, we spent a lot of time doing this content and I'm sure it will really help you understand this airline. But what we'll do today is we're going to go a little bit further in our understanding of low-cost Irish airline as a company um, and what you must understand as you, as you approach um, them. Um, part of this we've detailed even more in advanced interview course version 2, but this will be an opportunity today in case you have any questions also to ask them at the end of the presentation. Uh, then we're going to talk about um, the solutions that we have for you. So I expect that this whole presentation here uh, is going to take around 45 minutes, maybe even close to an hour to go all the way to understanding low-cost Irish airline. Um, and when I mean, when I say understanding low-cost Irish airline, it's also um, what you sh how you should approach this understanding in the way that you should tell them how much you've studied and why you like them so much. This is what we are going to try and, and get into detail with, because it's important that you understand that, that you understand what is a low-cost uh, airline in general and what is low-cost Irish airline in particular. So then we're going to talk about Advanced Interview Course version 2, which is our flagship course, which uh, will help you a lot with this selection. And then we're going to talk about our SIM preparation course, uh, which will help you with the SIM part of the exercise. So rest assured, we're not going to spend hours discussing these courses. Uh, we have videos on the website that um, explain every module. We're not going to get into that much detail today, but we're going to tell you what's new since, uh, you know, you may have seen the website before, what's new, what's relevant, what we've added, what will really help you for low-cost Irish airline. And then, of course, we'll have some questions. Good, so who am I? So uh, my name is Guillaume Debauché. If you don't know me, I am a former British Airways um, pilot. So I was a British Airways co-pilot for uh, seven years, five years on the 320, then two years on the 777. And then I left uh, for the Middle East, where I was a 777 co-pilot for four and a half years, and then um, Boeing 777 captain for four and a half years with Emirates, where I was also a um, professional recruiter. So I recruited uh, for them for, for quite a while, which was a significant part of my career. If you, uh, if you follow me a little bit, you know that I'm passionate about recruitment because getting on the other side of that curtain that caused me so much emotion when I was, um, when I was myself, like you, a candidate, uh, it was something incredible to discover. I had an idea of it through my readings because I failed my very first major airline selection and after that I never failed uh, I never failed another one but failing my first one was very painful and I studied and read lots of books on human resources and when I finally got on the other side of the curtain it was like oh my god it's even more sort of at the same time complex because it's very it's, it's almost scientific and it's um, 
to, to an extent very simple what they are looking for. And this is what I'm bringing you through my experience. So let's go back in uh, the, to the presentation. So now, you, now that you know who I am, and I'm working now full time on airline selection program. Our mission is to help you succeed at airline selections because um, uh, we believe, and I believe, I'm gonna go back here, I believe that there is a big gap between what you are taught at flight school. And in fact, a flight school really, really will give you a license and they, there's a big gap between that and what the airline expects. And there's still 20 years later, 20 years after I started my career and I was in your seat, there's not, not really a clear path that teaches you a clear course that teaches you um, the, 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 the knowledge that you need in order to really succeed at airline selections. Um, so that's, that's really my, my mission, my duty now, is to make it a more fair playing field by giving you the tools that you need to understand your future job. And today what we're going to do is we're going to understand our future airline, of course, low-cost Irish airline. Good stuff. So, uh, like we said, we're going to start with the assessment overview. And it's going to start from home. So if you're viewing this, uh, so we're recording this uh, video in November 2023. If you're viewing this several months or years later, it might have changed. But from home, you're going to do some psychometric tests. You're going to do a higher view, which is some questions that they are going to ask you on the screen. And you are going to have a limited time to answer. They are like an interview, but it's done without a person in front of you, not even on Zoom. It's like you, you get a question on the screen and then you've got one minute to answer. It's quite a, a stressful thing, this, and it's, uh, you, you can prepare. You can look at um, a video, a very good video. Um, if you type in YouTube, um, the high of you for a Fly Dubai interviews. Uh, and this, this video is excellent and it teaches you how to prepare your computer properly, you know, do the hardware setup properly so that you look nice, you look inviting, you look in shape, and it teaches you how to practice these sort of questions, which are always fairly basic, fairly classic, why you are here, why you want to join this airline, uh, what makes a good pilot, why they should choose you, um, and this sort of fairly basic questions, you should be quite articulate about them. Fortunately, they're always the same because the higher view is computer generated and therefore it's possible if you go on the websites that help prepare such as pilotassessments.com, you will know which questions so you can prepare them in advance. So it's a bit stressful if you're not ready, but if you're prepared, it's, it's quite easy at the end of the day. Okay, you have a higher view and then you may have some technical tests. So, uh, and then when you get to the airline, if you get further invited, then you'll have some more technical tests. Then you'll have an HR interview and a SIM assessment. So today um, we are going to focus on the HR interview and the SIM assessment because all the rest, well, you can prepare from home, really. This is a slide that you see very often that, that we share and I'm going to reshare it today. And don't worry if you've seen many of our other videos, we're not going to go into the full um, array of slides that we have on the key competency pyramid because we've got other things to cover today. But it's still important to understand that the airline selection process is a chain and there's many ways that you can put these links together. So, but here are the biggest building blocks. So application stage, it's um, you're writing your CV and cover letter and make them, making them feel like uh, seeing you. There is also, if you're a non-English speaking native, your English that you should prepare for months or years, even before this selection, so that it's good enough, so that you can sustain an interview in, uh, in a foreign language. That's application. Then you have the psychometrics, then the interview, and then the SIM. Okay, the, the order can change, but that's the four main building blocks, okay? Um, so today we're going to talk a little bit about each of these building blocks uh, when we discuss later on the solutions and the courses that we have. Um, but right now, in, uh, when it comes to low-cost Irish airline, we're going to talk mostly about the interview and, and the SIM. Good. So um, this is the only time you're going to see the key competency framework in this video. If you want to know what it is, there's, there are many other videos that we have on our YouTube channel that explain it. Or if you're a client, of course, you know this from module one of advanced interview course version two, but how the recruiter works. The recruiter will be evaluating key competencies. These competencies uh, for us, they are listed in this key competency pyramid with three found foundation bars. And sorry, you don't see anything because my face is here. This is a busy slide, so I have to put my face very small somewhere here. Um, and there are otherwise eight key competencies that are recruitment competencies that 
we've defined through our my work uh, that I did before at the airline, but also uh, we've added some that other airlines use to make a full key competency framework and major airlines will be using these competencies. And so what are they? There are eight competencies Typically, uh, your level of motivation, uh, your, the quality of your communication, problem solving, decision making, workload management. So there are eight of them and the recruiter will need to tick these boxes uh, before they hire you. It's mandatory for a recruiter who is working with key competencies. Now, um, at low cost Irish Airline, they work in a slightly different way, but still it's important to understand. This is what I'm describing here is, the, uh, is an advanced uh, interview environment. Now, low cost Irish airline is, it's a very advanced airline, but the recruitment is a little bit more simple, I would say. However, it is what I'm teaching you here is important for you to know because the recruiter, uh, whether it's advanced or less advanced, uh, is still ticking boxes and it's looking for certain competencies in a pilot, whatever the case. Um, so let's move on. They will be using a personality questionnaire if it's an advanced interview. Now, um, at low cost Irish Airline, there is a personality questionnaire, but uh, at the time of this recording, to our knowledge, it is being administered to you after the um, interview. Therefore, it is not used for the interview. It is probably a questionnaire that is being used as part of the validation that you don't have any dangerous behaviors to comply with ERSA regulations. Um, your, most airlines will have, if not all, will have to do the TD12 as well after the German wings. So it could be that they are using it in conjunction with that. But if they are administering it after the interview, well then it's not being used for the interview, which gives us a hint that um, they are, this is not an advanced interview, but a, a different type of interview. And indeed it's, an, it's a hybrid interview. So if what I'm telling you right now doesn't make sense because you're not familiar with our concepts, Stay on, it will make sense in a minute. Uh, good. And so uh, if they are, would be using the personality questionnaire, there would be uh, some danger areas that if you're in those danger areas, they will start to query and question you mostly around those danger areas to see if the personality questionnaire may be um, spotted that you are in a place most of the time, but you are able actually, depending on the circumstances, to evolve and then that will be okay and they will qualify the situation as acceptable, depending on how convincing you've been, okay? So this is how a recruiter works in an advanced recruiting um, environment. So, like we said, now there were different types of interviews. So there is the advanced interview, which is the one I just described using all the tools available to a recruitment department, whether it's aviation or not, and using all of this. And uh, where the personality questionnaire is great is that it allows a recruiter to know a lot about someone in just by looking at a sheet. And then they have, they've got the time to read and analyze the sheet and they've got one hour. And in this one hour, they're gonna, they're gonna get a really good idea of who you are. This is why these personality questionnaires are great because without being around you and with you for two weeks, you get a really, really good idea of how you're likely to behave in the future by uh, having an idea of how you said that you were behaving right now, uh, given the questions you were given. Okay, so it's, it's really great when you, you can use that. But not all companies do this. And um, in the old days and for less advanced airlines that have maybe less means or um, have, are basically growing very fast and don't have full-scale recruitment departments, then they will run a classic interview. And the classic interview is the most difficult of interviews because it is run by staff that's, that are not trained for uh, recruitment. It is being run by typically pilots, instructors, chief pilots, deputy chief pilots uh, who are being tasked to recruit and they think that they can and they have the best intentions and they are friendly and all of that, but they've not been trained to recruit. So what they are doing is that because they have no real idea of the recruitment key competencies, they're gonna be using the IKO key competencies and even then they are more or less going to use gut feeling to recruit you and it's gonna come down to do I like this person or not? And if I do like them, well, certainly other people are going to like them and then it's gonna be fine. And then they're probably gonna pick up the phone to get a recommendation. and. You see, this is flawed, in fact, because uh, because they like you, it doesn't mean that actually you, you'll be a, you'll be able to do the job properly tomorrow. That likability is not is not what you're being hired for. You're being hired for being able to do the job. That you're a nice person is a plus. Um, a person like 
him or her is a plus, maybe, but that's not how recruitment should be based. Recruitment should be based on how did this person behave in the recent past? And that tells us that they are likely to behave like in the same way in, a, in the near future with us. And then we, have, we collect evidence of the past through the personality questionnaire, through well-oriented questions, and then we have a good idea that they can do the job tomorrow. We document this, we tick the boxes of the competencies that we had to do, we document everything, and then it goes to the committee. But if you're not trained for recruitment, you don't know how to do this. And uh, so the classic interview is really problematic uh, because it is recruitment errors happen more often there. So, yeah, so it's the trickiest, in fact, is the classic interview. And now we have the hybrid interview, which is the one that low-cost Irish airline uh, uses, which I, I like a lot. Uh, the hybrid interview is very good as well. It is... Um, using hypothetical scenarios in order to... Yeah, so the hybrid interview is, is a more advanced version of the classic interview, so to say. So the recruiters, um, they have been trained in recruitment in a certain way. They will be using... Um, maybe they will be using a key competency framework, maybe not. But they have been trained in um, asking specific questions uh, related to the operation. So they will be asking you based on hypothetical scenarios, some, some questions. Um, and we will analyze a few questions uh, in a second. So you get an idea of what they are. They are operational. They force uh, you to use certain concepts and um, uh, give them an idea of your likely behavior. The, the big flaw with it is that it forces you to imagine something that you're, you could be doing completely differently in reality, okay? That's, that's the big flaw with it. But I still like it. And I think it's, uh, if you master, so for here in Advanced Interview Course uh, version 2, Module 4 really is dedicated to that, giving you all these concepts so that you can really um, have great arguments to explain how you would deal with this or that type of scenario. Okay, so let's get an example, for instance. So this is from the course, actually. Um, so I will give you a bit of time. So if you're on YouTube, you can pause the video. If you're, we are live, we're going to spend a bit of time. Um, so this, this question is typically, the weather is poor at departure and destination, as well as alternate one and two. By the way, this gives you a hint that if there's two alternates, it means the destination is below minimums. You, you've got that already. Um, and you want to take extra fuel, but typically the captain doesn't. And then what will you do? So this is a hybrid question. Basically, what do they want to see here? Um, they are going to want to see that you are not going to let the captain make a mistake. And they're going to play the role of the captain and they're going to say, yeah, but um, it's legal for us to go with this weather. What are you complaining about? Didn't you read all the emails that the airline has sent uh, recently that we should take minimum fuel and what, you want to waste some fuel? Um, and, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to take any extra fuel. And then the idea is that you tell them, yeah, well, well um, I don't feel good I would feel good going there if the weather was fine, but today the weather is borderline everywhere. We, we may have to hold, and um, I don't feel safe going like this. And then say, what What do you mean? It's legal. I said, yeah, well, the thing is, it's not safe, and I don't feel safe, and he doesn't feel safe, I'm not going to go. And then the, the captain will say, well, okay, so you're telling me that it's legal, you're telling me you don't want to fly, buddy. And, and then you say, yeah. That's what I'm telling you. And then he says, so should we go and tell the chief pilot? And then you say, yeah, let's go. Let's see what they have to say about your decision. They want to see that. Okay. And they would love to see as well that, um, and there's one thing as well, and with hybrid scenarios that I forgot to say, is always ask for more information. Okay. So whether it's poor at departure and destination, um, you could say, sorry, but what does that mean? How bad is bad? How bad is the weather? At, in particular, you want to know at destination, alternate one and two, how bad is bad? And then they might ask you, okay, well, how much fuel do you want then? They say, well, let's find yet another alternate, an alternate three, that's got better weather. And let's take fuel for that as an alternate now. That's what I would do as a captain. I always want to have an option where I know I can land and that's fine. And I'm going to still take a bit of extra fuel. Why? Because if the weather really is that bad, well, everybody's going to want to go to that alternate three and there's going to be some holding. Okay, you see, that's, uh, that's an, an example. Now, let's see about, uh, well, this is, the first one was example one, this one is example three. Captain is violating multiple SOPs during pre-fight climb, cruise, and descent. Would you take controls if he persists? 
So the captain is violating multiple SOPs during pre-flight climb, cruise and descent. Uh, would you take controls from him if he persists? Okay, so uh, here you, they want to see um, a lot of, especially young pilots, are intimidated by the idea of having to take control of the plane uh, from a misperforming captain. You shouldn't be worried about that, but of course you're not going to just take control. What they want to see is um, if you are going to... First of all, you could ask... What kind of SOPs? What's going on here? Did I notice this during briefing already? Um, how is the atmosphere bad as well? Or is he just violating SOPs? Okay, so they would like that you, you re-establish the context. And now they've got that, you say, okay, where are we now? Because it says cruise and descent. So are we on the approach now? Okay, so what they would want you to say now is say, listen, so if this has been happening for a while, I would have probably discussed it already during the cruise and asked him why he was doing like that. And so I could maybe learn something or also hint at the fact that if the deviations have been very many, I'm struggling to work properly and I would really like for him to or her to work in a, in a way that I can interface with them with. And if they dismiss you then, I would say, okay, well, just so you know, it's making me uncomfortable. Now, if the captain hears that, they better do something about it. If they don't, they're asking you, would you take controls? And the right answer there is to say, well, you see, if the flying remains safe all the way, then probably not. I'm going to try and survive for that flight and do my job the best I can and support the captain. But if at any point he is doing something unsafe, um, if it looks like some minimums are going to get burst or if he's doing something that's completely out of the SOP, then um, now I would have told that person several times that I'm not comfortable. Now, yes, there's a point where I will take over. But if everything else is normal and there's no safety implication, the fact that I would take over would actually reduce safety because I'm not going to lose the captain, then no, I'm not going to take over. Okay, you see? You see why these questions are so good? Because they force you to think. Let's do the next one. Um, so... You've reached your hold over time and are about to miss your slot. So basically this means you've got no more hold over time um, and you're close to max FDP and you know that if you don't go, you'll get exhausted. The flight could even be cancelled uh, if you don't depart now. ATC finally gives you lineup and takeoff clearance and the captain calls for takeoff. Calls for the before takeoff checklist typically um, with the intention to take off. What will you do? So that's an interesting one as well. So um, get more context. Why does the captain want to go? Can you give me more context? The holdover times expired, but it did continue to snow. Because we know that holdover times are guidelines. Now, if you had a holdover time for moderate snow, but the snow became light or the snow became no snow at all, um, then it could be justified. Then you would ask your assessor, what's the SOP? Normally, if you exceed the minimum holdover time, then the captain will make a decision. If really it didn't snow, you exceed the minimum holdover time. If the condition stopped, you could consider, well, actually, there's nothing. As a precaution, you would actually go and take a look at the wing from the inside of the plane. That's what you would do, and that's what it normally would say in the SOP. In fact, it says in the SOP normally that if the minimum holdover time was exceeded and if the minimum holdover time was at least 20 minutes, then you're allowed to extend. You're allowed to extend uh, on the basis that you go and check. Okay, But that's taking into account that it continued to snow. If it didn't continue to snow, you're in some sort of a gray area. But so the good thing to say is, that, listen, I would insist on an interior check. I'd say, yeah, but they give us takeoff clearance. I'd say, yeah, well, you know what? I would have insisted that we do this at the holding point, just before getting the takeoff clearance. This is how you get out of, of this sort of questions. You see that it involves technical and operational knowledge. And this is why I was telling you about the, this necessity to get this gap training, which gives you some meat on your bones, so to say, to be to have some something to say, okay? Because otherwise, it, these questions can be quite quite intimidating, of course. All right. So now let's go to the sim assessment part of this presentation. So the sim assessment for an airline selection is is different from any other sim exercise that you will ever do in your career. It is different from what you did at flight school. It's different from the MCC. Um, it's different from a type rating type sim. It's different from an LST and from an OPC. It is a completely different um, exercise altogether. Why is it different from MCC? It's because at MCC, you have the automatics most of the time. 
you, you fly very little raw data. You fly a bit of raw data, and if the instructor is nice, they will teach you how to fly raw data in a nice way. But you, it's not the point of the MCC at all. So now you're arriving at the assessment, and the last thing you've done is five or 10 MCC sims, and you have very little depth of knowledge uh, on how to fly this, uh, this sim assessment, which is without an autopilot, without a flight director, without the map, print this in your mind, you don't have the map, you have only a ROSE VOR followed by a ROSE ILS in most assessment sims. And in some of them also you won't have the auto throttle. Okay, you had all of that in the uh, MCC, you, you had the map in the MCC. So two things that are important to know here is you don't have the map, like I said, and you don't have the flight director, which means you take off in the blue sky with just a pitch target. Okay, that's something to be rehearsed. Okay. So now, to, to, to do this properly, you would want to have some sound handling techniques. So for this, the two main things that you must know is the five key pitch settings of uh, 737, but also the 320. And you need to know the pitch speed vs triangle. Good. And for the instrument flying, also you need to be good at spatial orientation and situational awareness on a plane that only has needles. You need to know how to get back to the airfield with just one needle. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you need to have the right behaviors between PF and PM because assessing behaviors is, is a very, very big part of the sim. And for low-cost Irish airline, it is paramount. Okay, this is really um, an extension for them of the of the interview. Bear in mind, at low-cost Irish airline, is something I forgot to say: there is no group interview at the time of this um, of this recording. So uh, I think that's quite good because honestly, I find group interviews quite unfair. Anything where the situation is different from one day to the next is unfair to the candidate. And I would love for recruitment to become as fair and ethical as possible. And group interviews are stressful for everyone. Yes, it's nice because you can see how candidates behave and you get a, a bit of a view on them. I find that if you have to have a group interview, it should not be eliminatory. It should be just a way to have an idea on what questions you're going to ask, not something that's going to in any way penalize um, a candidate, but that's just me. Anyway, so let's go back and move on to the next slide. Okay, so the five key pitch settings. So this is something that's in our sim preparation course, but we're gonna tell you a little bit about it today. Uh, so you have an idea. So these five key pitch settings, there are five configurations that you must know, and they will work whatever the weight of the plane. But anyway, um, during your sim assessment, you'll always fly the plane roughly at the same weight, which is um, you'll, be at, you'll be roughly at 60 tons uh, below max landing weight and uh, that's it. So it's, the speeds are pretty much all going to be the same with a green dot that's at around 220 knots or the flap up speed will be at around 220 knots. So that, that's fairly easy. Um, now for these pitch settings, the thrust, the idea with them is that you will, four of them are level so that you can configure the plane and you always configure the plane level. And the last one is a three degree on the glide. And the thrust will vary very little. It will be between 50 and 60 percent, and um, and uh, except for one setting where the thrust will be higher, um, when you have all the drag just before you go down on the glide, Th these pitches they don't change with the weight of the plane, but the uh, the speed will vary if the plane um, is lighter. Okay, but anyway. If you know these pitches, you can fly this plane um, whatever the weight. So it's, it's quite magical. It's really great to, to know it. And then, um, so you memorize the pitch and you memorize the, the configuration, the pitch, and then the thrust will not vary very much. You'll have to memorize that as well. Uh, and then it works whatever the weight. What will happen is if the weight is lower, um, your resulting speed will change. So for instance, if your flap up speed on a Boeing or your green dot speed is 220 knots, on uh, a heavy plane, on a lighter plane, it will be 210 knots, but the pitches, they will be the same. Okay, um, good. So these are the five key pitch settings. The pitch one, you are at flap up, 250 knots level. Okay, so you basically you're, you're at 6,000 feet there and you're, you're on your intermediate approach. And the pitch two, you're slowing down. So you go to flap up speed, um, which uh, 737 pilots uh, called bug up, bug up speed till today, flap up speed. Level, so you're slowing down, so your pitch will increase a bit, of course. And then you're going to take one more stage of flap, flaps five, 
and then flap five speed, as you say on a Boeing, which will bring you to around 190 knots. And then you're gonna pitch up again. Every time you pitch up by 1.25 degrees, okay? At some point then, you're gonna end up descending, yeah? Because initially you were at 6,000 feet, then you slow down. You would try and slow down when you're level. That's the whole idea of this. And then at some point you descend, and then you do another slow down and config, and then you descend. And so when you arrive here at the fourth, you're now uh, sort of on very long final and now you're going to take gear down flaps 15 and you're going to take flap 15 speed and you're going to fly level and this is where after that you're going to intercept the glide and so this sort of config if you do it a bit early then you're going to end up um, so you pitch up again so pitch one was at a certain point again 1.25 degrees every time and then you arrive at pitch four and now you have quite a lot of drag so uh, you may have to go as far as 75% of uh, thrust, okay? Um, and then after that, you have to pitch down a lot, uh, more than 5 degrees, you pitch down almost 6 degrees, and you, um, you take flaps uh, 20 and then flaps 30 on the glide, okay? So there's a whole technique to, to use this that, that takes time to detail, and we detail in, in uh, the same preparation course, but I'm going to try in the frame of this uh, presentation to give you as much as possible. So already you had the pitch setting. So this is a drawing that's in the, uh, sorry, I'm gonna remove my face, uh, that we have in the same preparation course. And uh, typically you see that the first one is, is, is here. It's between two and a half and five degrees. And you would have your square here that would fit in here, the, the pitch target. And then pitch one, pitch two, pitch three, pitch four, okay? And then the last one, uh, you pitch down quite a lot and you arrive below what was the pitch one. You arrive between zero and two and a half, okay? So that's, that's the whole idea. And then there's a whole, a whole lot more to learn about the, uh, the go-around pitch and all of that. But these five key pitch settings are really useful because if at any point um, you have to get back to basics in accordance to your speed and your configuration, you can put the pitch first and then put the thrust and everything else will stabilize. So it's really something that you will want to master. So the best way to learn it in my view is to uh, learn it through the sim preparation course. But what you can do is when you go and prepare before your uh, low cost Irish airline selection is to uh, ask your the sim preparation company that will do it for you. And we can recommend some, but you can find, find some yourself as well. And you ask them um, to show you this. Okay, to, to show you how to configure the plane, ask them that, how to configure the plane from 250 knots uh, flaps up. And they, sh they should be able to teach you. The problem is, if you go to a sim preparation center and they teach, teach you this on the day and you only had one session, then you're not going to have learned it. So it's going to take you a bit of time to process it and you might not be able to, to be proficient immediately. Okay, so that's why we created the course. Um, good. So I hope this is useful. So let's move on. So now the pitch vs uh, pitch speed vs triangle. This one's very important as well. So this is to use when you need to do an ad adjustment of your vs. So typically, if the assessor will ask you, okay, um, climb at 2,500 feet a minute, and they tell you, okay, you're at 180 knots. How many degrees does does that take? You have to be able to answer that quickly. Okay. And by the way, the reference speed here is TAS. It's true airspeed. It's not ground speed. Uh, and it's not indicated airspeed, so it's TAS. Now, if you're at 10,000 feet, of course, the TAS and the IIS are not the same. There's a, a difference. Now, if you're at 6,000 feet, it's less. If you're on the approach, you can consider that they're almost the same. Now, this is what it is. So say we're going to assume here that we're going at 180 knots um, uh, TAS. So we're going to assume we're like at 2,000 feet, so the TAS and the IIS are the same. So this is the relationships. You've got one degree, uh, so one degree would be one mile per minute, 100 feet per minute. But if you're going at three miles per minute, you need to say that it's 300 feet per minute, okay? So the, the triangle normally starts at one, one, one. But if you're at one degree, but you go faster, then you need to multiply this one as well. So one degree, three miles per minute, 300 feet per minute. This means that if you're at 180 knots, uh, 180 knots is three miles per minute, okay? So it's if you're at 180 knots, if you pitch up by one degree, uh, you're going to achieve 300 feet per minute. And I mean, it's surgical, okay? With the one thing to, to not get a, make a mistake on is this, the IAS and the TAS, because then, then it could be wrong. So if you're at 6,000 feet, uh, you can take a look at your, your um, ground speed and 
remove the wind to, to have a, an idea of what your task actually is. And then um, that's the reference speed. So you have three miles per minute, that's for 180 knots, and you have four miles a minute, that's for 240 knots, and you have five miles a minute for uh, 300 knots. So if you had 250 knots at six or 8,000 feet, maybe you're actually closer to 300 knots, then it's five miles per minute. Then one degrees of pitch will be 500 feet a minute. In this case, if they ask you to climb at 2,500 feet per minute, well, you will need five degrees of pitch. It's as simple as that, okay? But you need to practice this. You need to get a friend to ask you, okay, um, you're going at four miles per minute um, and they ask you to climb at 2,000 feet per minute. How much is that gonna be in pitch? And you need to practice that so that it's quick in your head, okay? And that way, when they ask it during the same exercise, then you can actually tell them you can tell them what you're, what you're doing. You can tell them, okay, 2,500 feet a minute. I'm going right now. I've got 250 knots indicated. That's roughly 300 knots um, task. Uh, that's five miles per minute. So um, I will pitch up by five degrees and should achieve two and a half thousand feet per minute. If you say that, oh my God, the instructor is going to be really impressed. Okay, so learn, learn this theory. It's really very useful. And you can practice this in your simulator at home as well, which is great. Um, good. So this, this technique is useful when you're being asked to make evolutions during the in initial part of the sim assessment. So let's do this one. So if you were asked to climb at 1000 feet per minute at 180 knots, then you would pitch up by roughly three degrees. Okay. And that would, that would work. And by the way, then when you're on the approach at 140 knots on, on the glide, you're going at 2.5 miles per minute. You're going 140 knots, which is 2.5 miles per minute. So there, it's useful when adjusting your VS on the glide as well. So on the glide, you go at 700 feet per minute average if you're at 140 knots. This is where people get it wrong as well. When they're on the glide, they overcorrect. On the glide, usually if you're low or if you're high, one degree is enough to fix the situation. Because if you go at seven, if 700 feet per minute is the target to maintain the glide and you're a bit low, it's enough to pitch up by one degree to achieve a reduction by 200 feet per minute, 250 feet per minute, which should, if you're patient, it should be enough. And as the diamond comes to you, you touch the bottom of the diamond and you would push so that by the time you've done this, you've regained your degree, so to say, okay? So a two degree correction is always too much on the glide. And if you uh, pull by three degrees, then you're gonna be flying level again. And now it's really too much. Uh, you're going to go through the glide and have the problem in the other direction. Okay, so this is a very useful technique. Good, um, let's move on to uh, instrument flying skills. So it's about your spatial orientation, obviously, because you're gonna take off and then you're going to do some evolutions and then it's easy to get disoriented. And most people do, I probably would as well. After a while, if you get anyone to turn many times, this and climb, you know, you're focused on, on, on approaching your heading and all of that, you know, it would be good if you could develop a situational awareness to look at your needle and to have an idea of where you are. Usually the VOR will be located on the airfield. So there's always a VOR on an airfield. It's very rare that there's not. Um, like Dubai doesn't have one, for instance, anymore, but it's very rare. And usually there's always a beacon on an airfield. Um, and so you should know where you are. And so your instrument flying is expected to be good from a recently qualified student pilot, okay? So you should know how to intercept a radial and an ILS axis, navigate and hold to a beacon and hold at an intersection, which is a bit tricky. Um, you should be able to fly an arc DME so it's rarely requested, but the ArcDME is a great way for you to be able to return to an airfield if everything else, they tell you everything is failed and you don't have a chart, you can't do a procedural approach. The ArcDME is great, it's a thing you should know how to do. And you should be able to fly a circuit with a fully functional 737. And you should be able to do all of that raw data, APFD, ATHR, auto throttle off, okay? Uh, so the circuit, it's a bit complicated if you don't know the SOP, so put that one between brackets. Now, if you're experienced, you'll be expected to do that, of course, also with a fully functional plane, but then you'll be expected also to do an engine failure after V1 and stuff like that. Teamwork and leadership. Um, so it's important for you to understand that leadership is not just the prerogative of the PF. The PM has a very important leadership part to play. It's pilot monitoring. Before it was PF, pilot flying, PNF, pilot not flying or pilot not in function, okay? That's not the way it is now. Monitoring is an active role. It means you have to help the pilot. If you see a situation develop, you have to voice your concerns. Don't overdo it, do it appropriately so that you don't drown the PF or 
uh, frustrate them, but you have to tell them, you know, for instance, it's too high. Um, hey, I, I think that we're a bit high. Perhaps if you adjust your rate of descent by 300 feet, it, it would help. Or if they're flying raw data, I say, okay, you're doing great, or you're a little bit on the left of the localizer, I suggest heading 278 and stuff like that. You know, this is an active monitoring role. Um, monitoring is an active role that is graded. It will certainly be graded during selection. It will be graded later on when you're on the line. So the PM should monitor, assist, and prompt as required. And if safety is in question, then the PM may have to intervene decisively and take over. So um, there again, you would use a gradual intervention model where you would, you would start to prompt and prompt and prompt. And now if, for instance, you can have it, it happens during selection uh, scenarios that, that people freeze. It does happen, unfortunately. Um, there's too much, too much charge, uh, too much emotional charge, and they freeze. So you could have someone at minimums that doesn't go around. And if you don't take over, you will both fail. So be ready for that. I hope it doesn't happen to you. Uh, but by having good CRM throughout the exercise, you'll probably manage to keep your partner on board so that the situation doesn't happen. Okay, so a typical session will be, um, you'll have the briefings will be done in the classroom, which will give you a bit of time uh, so that you don't waste the uh, sim time later on. Uh, the airplane will be lined up. So that then you arrive in the sim, the airplane is lined up, engines running, minimum setup by the PF with radio aids and minimum MCP setup because you're not tape rated, so you're not supposed to know more than that. So the instructor will do the rest. And you do a minimal rebrief of 30 seconds max if they allow you to, um, which could be a very, very minimal uh, takeoff review. And then it goes quick once you're in the seat, okay? Um, now, this is what I would suggest that you do in the classroom briefing. Always start with threats. It's, it's fashionable to do a threats uh, briefing. Some schools teach to do it after. I think it's much more pragmatic to do a threats briefing before because once you brief the threats, you brief what's important. That's when you have the most energy. It's at the beginning of the briefing. Okay, so you brief the threats and after that, you can use this WANT acronym, weather, airport, no times, terrain. The charts, check the number and date. Make sure you have the same. The seat name, the runway and the seat altitude. You don't have to read everything on the chart. Um, airline pilots that are experienced don't do that. It's like well, you're on the plane, both of you have checked the FMS against the chart. There's no need to reread the whole thing, but you have to read what's mandatory. What's mandatory is the chart number and date, the seat name, the runway, and the seat altitude. This you have to do. So you brief that um, because the threats you've briefed before. So if there's a threat such as a frequency change, like there is in Dublin, uh, or any other type of threat such as terrain, like there is also in Dublin in the south. Um, then you can brief it there and you don't have to re-say it again and waste some time because reading a chart, if you read the full chart, it can take forever and can really drown the other, the other person. Then you would do an emergency briefing. We have a very nice emergency briefing in the sim preparation course that you can rehearse. So you do it before V1, after V1, and then you go on the perf page, you check the weight, check the flap and check the speeds. And then you ask if there's any questions and call for the before takeoff checklist. You will only have like very four very simple checklists to do before takeoff, after takeoff, approach and landing. That's it. And the instructor is likely to say checked, done, uh, because they have a reduced version of it. You will see them lean on the pedestal and complete the actions that you've not done that are needed and so on. And you're not supposed to, to know how to do all. Good. You're likely to have a non-technical event such as a sick passenger, a toilet fire at the back, a bomb on board. So write those down um, because you have to think of how you would manage. So these non-technical events, they um, involve a control handover. The biggest mistake is people would be, so you're in the right seat, right, when you do it, and it happens, and then maybe um, the person comes, say, oh, we have a sick passenger. And, it, and remember, you don't have the autopilot. And so you're, you're there flying, and even if you had the autopilot, you couldn't do it. And you're there flying, and then you're going to start to talk to the person. No, no, no. Uh, you could do, okay, hang on. And you go, okay, the airplane is flying fine. Navigation is assured. Okay, there's a problem down the back. You have control. Okay, other person takes control and you go, okay, passer, please, what is the situation? And now you can deal with it. Now you do your DODAR and your NITS and then you set up the plane. You set up the FMS, which you don't know how to do because, because you're not type rated. Then you ask the instructor, um, at this point, I would set up the FMS. Once you've set up the FMS, you take control, you ask the other person to check the FMS and you start your briefing, okay? and you maintain situational awareness throughout. Because at some point during your Dodar, you're gonna to come to a decision as to what's gonna be the best airport to go to. There is more to it. Uh, I expand on it a lot in Advanced Interview Course version two to give you a full scope of how you can come to a good decision 
in any kind of problems, uh, any kind of situations, and it involves a model that's a little bit more um, advanced and also for you to um, pre-think some scenarios. So here you've got three that you need to think of. You would want to pre-think your actions. I often say, as if you are flying single engine pistons, you probably have around 10 scenarios in your mind that you should be able to cater for and you already know roughly what you're going to do. If you're flying a twin, maybe you've got 15. If you're flying a 7.3 or an Airbus 320, maybe you've got 40 because now you've got more complicated systems. And if you've got a long haul plane, now we're talking about 100 because you've got a more complex plane, more people flying further and yeah. So you have to know these and this part of your job to learn more and more and more scenarios that are sort of prefabricated in your head so that you can focus after that on the variables. Okay, so to conclude this part of the presentation, and um, I knew this was going to be a long presentation because there's a lot to still cover on low-cost Arisha airline. We've not yet talked about the airline itself, but to conclude this part, um, the skills pilots need to succeed at airline selections are, as you can see, they are numerous. Most Candidates, when they leave flight school, they underestimate this. Flight schools, they really focus on getting you a license. Very few of them focus on also getting you, uh, uh, you know, giving you all the tools you need to um, get you a job. And actually, it's not part of their remit. The bit where you teach yourself how to pass the selection, it actually befalls on you. And so many of these skills are not within the remit of the ATO. And yeah, specialized training is required to optimize your success. It's the last thing you're going to need to invest in uh, and the last thing you're going to need to do before you enter the airline. So you're very close now to the finish line. You've done all of this work for so long now. And this is the last thing you're going to need to convince the airline that you mean business, that you are keen, that you know your stuff, that you've learned as much as possible uh, on the job. Okay, good. Okay, so now we're going to talk about our favorite airline, low-cost Irish airline. And we're going to talk a little bit about the free course. So... Um, most of you watching this now will have the free course and gotten at least the ebook. And um, let's now get into it. What you must know about low cost Irish Airlines in the ebook and in the sheets. So, this is your beautiful ebook. And in this, I deliver seven secrets to pass low cost Irish Airlines selections. So, let's uh, look at it. So, it is the number one airline when it comes to flight crew training. So, okay, this is fine. This won't help you to pass your selection. It's just nice to know and good to know that this is a great place to work for sure. Preparation is a must. Yes. There is no group interview. We talked about it. But CRM is key and it's done in the sim. Yes. Higher view. We discussed the higher view already. And I think I put the link somewhere here on the YouTube video. And if I haven't, just go and get it. Uh, it's, it's really good. The hybrid interview, I think we discussed. And there's some more advice. Yeah, the recruiter is not your friend. <laughs> recruiter is a recruiter. And yeah, sim preparation isn't just about flying the plane. This, this is about getting you the skills you need flying wise. What we discussed about flying the plane, the pitch settings and, and the pitch speed VS triangle, but also the pilot flying, pilot monitoring and revising your scenario. So that's what we have in, uh, in the ebook. So uh, not so much new here uh, that I wanted to share with you today. So. This one is the airline fact sheet, it's the main fact sheet. So it's important that you study your airline in detail. Now you can't go into a ridiculous amount of detail, reading their annual report to every figure, there's 400 and something pages in a large company's financial report. You can't read all this, but you see what we've done and you should be able to make your own from that, okay? So that you know what we're talking about. And I like to, um, I like to collect data and I like to see about if they are profitable or not. Okay, uh, and so this airline has become profitable in 2023. So that's that's an achievement given their growth. Okay, so you want to look at that, and then you would find that also this airline has very little or no debt. Um, there's different definitions of debt depending on where you go, but it's a very very stable airline and it's a profitable airline. And actually, to me, the fact that low cost Irish airline has been for so long. I mean, the only time they haven't been profitable was during COVID that they've been so profitable for so long is one of the reasons you're gonna to wanna to join. When choosing an employer, you want to have an employer who makes profit. And one of the main things that low-cost Irish airline have changed and other low-cost airlines as well, is before them, airlines were not profitable. The airline business in general was just financial pit. Most um, airlines, such as even Air France, were going borderlining bankruptcy fairly regularly to the point that the government bailouts were required, okay? So from a pure company perspective, low-cost Irish airline is an incredible company. Before them, 
there was no profit in the airline industry. And they went like, oh my God, things need to change. And they changed it. And now these airlines are profitable. What does it mean if they are profitable? Well, they'll be here to serve their customers for longer. For you as an employee, it's a much more reassuring to know that you're working in a place that's, that's likely to still be there in a few years, maybe even your whole career without requiring a bailout, um, of which the issue could be uncertain. Um, it also means that you're likely to have opportunities inside. Um, <clears throat> it means that it's the number one thing. Even when you're inside a company, whichever company you work for, aviation or not, you always want to be in a department that's making money. Because a department that doesn't make money, even if it's an exciting new project, it could, you know, it could not work. You want to be in a place that makes money. So we love these, these low-cost airlines for what they've done. They've reshaped the aviation industry by making something that seemed impossible, which was to make an airline profitable, profitable. They've also invented plenty of things. As, as you know, low-cost Irish Airlines strategy has been to operate to smaller regional airports, which was more efficient from a cost base. And they allowed plenty of people to travel who could not travel before. I mean, they've, they've done a lot for, for passengers and, and, and clients, customers and guests, as they call them. And they've really, really achieved a lot. So being part of that is exciting. Okay, so profitable. They have a purpose, which they fulfilled and they give you opportunities that others can't. You would be excited to get into a low-cost airline because of the prospect of being able to fulfill many roles throughout your career. Cope first officer, captain, instructor, maybe base captain, maybe manager, uh, maybe you can work in safety, maybe you can work in some sort of coordination role. All of this is open to you very quickly after you join. But if you work for a major airline, you have to really wait until you've got your fourth bar, which could be 15 years away before anyone takes you seriously for a job in the office or a significant job in the office. You see what I mean? Um, so that's why it's so exciting. I would go with that mindset to my low-cost Irish airline interview going, oh my God, what you've done, I want to be part of it, you know? Good. And now when you say something at the interview, back it up. It's profitable. I would ask you, yeah, are we profitable? Since when? How much? And I would say, yeah, you made a 1.3 billion euros profit in 2022. And there was a, a small loss two years before, a fairly large one in COVID, of course, but you recovered. It's an amazing performance. Now, you could uh, discuss as well that the airline has little to no debt, which is incredible. And you could discuss also their profit margin, which is very high. So to get the Profit margin, you take the profit and you divide the turnover by the profit. So you will see that low cost Irish Airline has very, very high profit margin. I think this year it was around 10, 12 or 15 percent. So you take the net profit and um, because it is so high, you know, the fact that the airline makes money has also another consequence. They have money to spend and they can buy more planes and they can buy more new planes. OK, so uh, and they can be debt free after several years of, of making profit, which Major airlines, they can't. Major airlines carry so much debt, you know. Um, most of them have, it will take them on, if they have a good year of profit, if they would be able to reproduce this profit, it would take them seven to 10 years for most of them to be debt free when low cost airlines are debt free. Uh, for, I mean, not all, but this one uh, is debt free of, depending how you, you look at the document, they are almost debt free, okay? So when you go there, you say it's profitable, which is good for me, good for the clients. It's uh, reshaped the industry. Um, it's got a mission that is fulfilled. It's giving me opportunities and you have the figures to back what you're saying. OK, so we could carry on looking at this document and you see that the net cash, they've got cash. They don't have debt. Wow. Amazing. Try and find that word in uh, Air France or British Airways even uh, document. So anyway, this, there's your profit and then um, so you would go, you would take the turnover, the total revenue turnover, this, you would divide that, you would divide this uh, uh, by that and you would see it's around 10%, which is quite, quite high given the time that we are now and this, you're still carrying so much of the scars of the COVID. And then you can see that they've got cash. Yeah, amazing. So then you look for keywords and, and you get them um, on the annual report, you get them in Wikipedia, mostly on, on the website and on, mostly on the annual report. The top of the annual report gives you just about everything you need. Uh, low fares, reliable punctual service, no frills experience, okay. 
now we've got some the, a fleet sheet. I'm trying to find the keywords. I think they are in the uh, so we've got a fleet sheet that will save you a lot of time. Looking at this fleet sheet, here we go. Yeah, and then um, this history. That's very important that you understand the history that you know how they were called before they were called Ryanair and stuff like that. So then we have a selection synoptic sheet, but uh, yeah, there's a place where, because um, I'm reading um, at a distance here, so um, essentially the keywords are, um, they don't call uh, clients, they don't call passengers passengers or clients, they call them guests and they have hardworking aviation professionals instead of employees. Typically that's, that's, that's what it is. So look at the, the annual report. It reveals all of this very, very clearly. Um, and so you, you should try and use these keywords during your letter, during your interview, and don't overuse it. Just maybe at the end of the interview, if you can say, oh, and I'm looking forward to working with you and being like you, or being a hardworking aviation, because I'm a hardworking aviation professional, something like that. A little hint, these people in front of you, they breathe this vocabulary day in, day out. That's, you know, when you're an airline pilot, you get so many emails from the company all the time about the new plan, the new strategy, the flight ops email, the new change in the SOP. And all this vocabulary is always there. It's part of you. It becomes part of you. So if you arrive at the interview and you use some of these words, they will like it. They will think it's smart of you. It's respectful of you because you've done your job, you've done your research and, and, and it's good. You should know your keywords. Okay, so I think with all these sheets that we've done, uh, it will really help you out. And then, of course, inside Advanced Interview Course version 2, we have a full Ryanair case study where I, I go about what I just said now in, in more detail. We have more time, and so uh, we, we exploit this information better. We go together on the website, and I show you where I look, and I show you how, how I go about making these sheets. Um, the, all the different financial ratios, I explain everything so that it's easy for you to do it for any airline, in fact. Good. So... Um, yeah, so what's a large low-cost airline is, um, you should know that as well, in, from an operational perspective. It um, has excellent training and SOPs. This is where they kind of wrong-footed the major airlines because now these, I've worked for British Airways. Um, I mean, they gave me seven beautiful years, but then when I went to work for Emirates, I mean, I was like, oh my God, I've, <laughs> you know, they, they taught me so much. And then when I was recruiting, I recruited a lot of, of pilots who came from low-cost Irish airline. And in fact, my batchmate came from low-cost Irish airline when I did my, uh, my second 777 type rating. He was so good. Oh my God, he was so well-trained. He had to learn to fly a larger plane, of course, with the inertia and all that. But from a procedural perspective, I mean, his knowledge of the FMS, it was, I mean, he was much better than me there. So they train you really well. And I know that we enjoyed always seeing low-cost Irish airline candidates and we would hire most of them because they've been so well-trained. Um, so something to know as well is the low-cost airline has a limited operational complexity. Uh, they are mostly flying point to point. It's a bit more simple compared to a major airline. I mean, it's not something you would tell them, but it's, it's just the truth. It's a bit more simple. You don't cross that many borders. You don't go outside of Europe very much uh, or whatever territory you're in. It's a bit more simple, okay? Uh, and then the like, next point I had was, um, yeah, they're very, very focused on your efficiency in flying. So economical flying, you have to understand what it is. A lot of young pilots, I ask them, what do you think is efficient flying? And they say, oh, it's about flying a constant distance approach. Well, we've been flying constant distance approaches for years and years. Ever, ever since I've flown, it's been the way people like to fly. It's more elegant, it's more efficient and stuff. No, efficiency in, in flying, it's a bit more complex than that. And it starts with fuel, really. It starts by not carrying extra fuel when you don't need it. In the old days, when I started flying 20 years ago, people would always carry a bit of extra fuel and stuff. And now it's a big no-no. So it's about being very precise on how much fuel you take. It's also by understanding your operational environment. And for instance, I was discussing with someone today, um, flying slower, flying next to green dot or at cost index zero doesn't necessarily, yeah, it will consume less fuel for that flight, but it could cost more money altogether because well, if you arrive late, then there are other implications. You know, maybe, maybe the next guy is going to have to speed up to catch the schedule. Or, you know, you, you have to understand um, that to fly the plane at the optimum level, as close to possible as the cost index. And if you have to fly faster, you would do it in consultation with the airline. Say, okay, I'm going to have to fly faster in the next sector. I'm going to need some extra fuel. Is this what you want to do? Or are we going to carry, are we going to carry a delay throughout these flights? Sometimes they'll tell you to just take the delay. That's fine. You're landing at 11 p.m. We, we don't need the plane before the next day. Just take the delay. That's fine. 
Sometimes they'll tell you, no, the plane is needed. You know, you're landing at 2 p.m., fly faster, we'll sacrifice 200 kilos of fuel. So it's about knowing that also that you're not alone um, and that there's a, much, a more complex environment around you than just your flight that you're on. Yeah, know their numbers and keywords, understand their strategy and the way to go about it. There's things you must know. You must know a lot about the 737. In the sim preparation course, I will show you later. We've got some, some um, airplane fact sheets on the 73 and the 320, but uh, and you, you have to know the 737 really well, even if you're not typewriter. You have to know that the uh, 737 MAX with them is called the 8200 Game Changer. You have to know why. You have to know the story about MCAS, even if I wouldn't mention it during the interview. But if they ask you what's MCAS, you should be able to answer that question. If you don't know what it is, you can watch the next Netflix series uh, about, about that and you will know all about it. Or you could download our sheet inside the sim preparation course. That's all we have for the training on low-cost Irish airline. So at the interview stage, we've got an advanced interview course version 2, which, you, which of course you know is the only uh, e-learning course in the world focused on airline selections. So it's here in the chain. Um, and so this course is in version 2 now, so it's got a lot more detail. Um, so 13 hours of content, I've got five case studies, one on Air France, British Airways, EasyJet, low-cost Irish airline and, and Wizz Air. And we've done it this way because once you understand these five airlines, you can understand them all pretty much. Um, the, the 16 PF questionnaire and debrief, which makes this really unique because you got a real questionnaire. You can really learn to see how you will be perceived by an airline that uses a personality questionnaire and see where your areas of weakness could be perceived so that you can prepare your questions better. You get monthly Q&A sessions. The next one is next week. Uh, free access to select work workshops. Tomorrow we have a workshop about Aer Lingus, for instance. So it's free to clients. We have an iOS and an iPadOS app. We are introducing a psychometric assessment tool as well. And you have the option of a one-to-one -one with me, which is at an extra fee, which is what I really recommend if you're going for a major airline selection. Um, the modules, you can look at that if you're curious about the modules on the advanced interview course page, which I will give you a QR code in a second and you can go and take a look at it. But believe me, it is detailed and it is very well segmented. And uh, it's uh, people tell me that the production quality uh, on version two really made it enjoyable to watch. So what's new in version two then? So we've gone from eight hours to 13 hours of brand new content. It goes into a lot more detail. Uh, it's got studio quality like this evening. The segmentation of the course is great. The case studies, the Q&A sessions, the workshops, and we've got a psychometric assessment tool, which is brand new. You're actually the first ones to know tonight uh, that we are introducing this. So we already had the 16 PF, and now we're going to have another tool, um, which you're going to get. And this tool is Pilot360. This is a software that we have developed uh, in partnership with another company. Basically, it's our own development. Um, so we're very proud of it. It's not a product that existed that we rebranded. No, no, it's our product. And this product will be rolled out at select flight schools. And uh, we think in a few uh, months or years, some airlines will even take it. It's a great, great assessment tool. And if you want to get it as a pilot, the only, only place where you can get it is going to be through Advanced Interview Course. No one else will be able to try Pilot360 as a pilot apart from if you are being assessed, but through advanced interview course version two. You'll have one go. Um, of course, you could practice with pilot assessments before, um, but basically we're giving you this because we found that a lot of clients, they wanted to know how, how good they are. are. Are they good enough? So basically it's included in the course now and people will have the opportunity to choose because we are going to debrief now the 16 PF by one way video. We're going to record a video with the 16 PF and if that's the case, then you get the Pilot 360 and we'll debrief both together. If people would prefer to have a longer 16 PF debrief, so one-to-one -one debrief on Zoom, then they will not get the Pilot 360. It's a bit of a, of a choice between the two because can, uh, clients who are at ATO level, they prefer to have the Pilot 360. And clients that, for instance, they've already done the equivalent, they, they've already been through a QT or a C1 at Air France, and they just come for us for the last stage, they want to have a, a bigger 16 PF debrief. So we give the, the two options, okay? But we're very, very proud of what we have achieved. It's like a year and a half of development to get to this result, and uh, it's, it's a fantastic tool. And the great thing is to be able to put the two together, the 16 PF and the Pilot 360. Good. So if you want to um, take a look at the modules, what's inside Advanced Inter Interview Course Version 2, you could just go ahead and you can flash the code. I will take you straight to the course where you will see another video. You will see me talking again uh, about the course. And there you will see the, all the modules and all of that. 
sweet. Um, okay, now the sim preparation course is the only e-learning course for sim selection. And this is a course that adds a lot of operational knowledge. I like to say it's a sim preparation and operational knowledge course. Now you will see in the, in the pricing that actually it's not a very big step from advanced interview course to, to the gold package, which gives you the CVN cover letter and the sim preparation course. So it, it gives you a lot more. And I, I think it's a really great course to start to really understand what is the life of an airline pilot on top of learning how to fly the plane. So this is now obviously at the sim stage. Okay, and so what it's got is um, 12 modules. They're a bit shorter than in advanced interview course. Um, and six hours of content altogether. So it's got the five key pitch settings for the 320 and the 73, fact sheets for both planes, practical handling and orientation uh, strategies, or operational procedures and expected behaviors. It's got the app as well. By the way, the app has offline viewing, so you can, you know, if you're commuting on the plane, you could download before you go and you can watch any of our content this way. Okay, I'm not gonna go into detail, but, um, on top of what I've mentioned already, it teaches you how to manage your energy on the plane, uh, what to do if you're high, the stabilized approach criteria, the difference between going around and the discontinued approach, uh, how to fly uh, the specific cases that low-cost Irish Airlines use, such as the, the East Midlands case, um, how to come back to the airfield with just one needle, um, how to conduct good briefings and all of this. Um, so again, I will invite you, I'll give you a QR code in a second, you can go and check the video I've recorded there to explain the detail of the course. And so now we have also these aircraft fact sheets, um, which in the case of the 73 includes an explanation of the MCAS and, and uh, some more information that will be useful to you. And this is the QR code where you can get the course now. Good. Sweet. So you can take a picture of it. I'm sure you can find it otherwise. And if you're on YouTube, you can pause the video and I will just move on. Good. So now we're at the application stage and we'll cover very quickly the psychometrics in a second. But at the application stage, we have um, two extra courses, CVN cover letter course, a very popular course. It's kind of an entry product, if you, if you will, where we teach you how to write a good CVN cover letter. We teach you how to write it. We don't write it for you. To write it for you, we have a CVN cover letter review service and a CVN cover letter write, or, and a cover letter uh, writing service. Most people don't get satisfied with the first tier. They buy the product and then they get just a review, which is where we spend an hour on the screen and we write the letter. Provided the client has done a lot of work on the letter, we managed to get it all done in an hour. And then the English proficiency course, which as a disclaimer, I'll say um, it's got 15 lessons now. <clears throat> uh, the first 10 have some French in it, uh, but from 10 to 15, it's all English. Those who are not French have taken the course have said that the bit of French that there is in it was not a problem. They were really able to use the course very well. As we go, we are going to add more and more and more only English lessons. So English, 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 pure English lessons. There's lots of stuff in the course and um, I let you go and visit the, um, the page to find out more. Good. And now at the psychometric stage, um, we recommend you to go to pilotassessments.com, which is our go-to service. And for low cost Irish airline, it is the best. And uh, otherwise, there are other services which you can use for other airlines. Um, so if you don't find an airline in, at Pilot Assessments, go to latestpilotjobs.com. If you use this link, which is pilotassessment.com slash pilot slash ASP, it's an affiliate link, but we don't get very much fr uh, from it. But what you get is that you can switch packages um, that's uh, if basically you need to go from one subscription to another in the middle of your um, days remaining. Good, but anyway, um, that's just to cover the chain to tell you where to go, but I'm, I'm sure you do know where to go. And again, on psychometrics, we've got this Pilot360 now that's included for our clients. I mean, it's, it's great because it's like, it takes two hours, you know, you're in really exam conditions, uh, the thing takes screenshots of your camera, it checks if you're browsing other windows, if you're losing focus, and it will put that in the report. You know, it's like the, ex the exercises are great, but also the whole system we've put around it for it to be stable, uh, it's, it's great. And then after that, you've got a great result, and we can tell you, you need to work more in mass, you need to work more in this and, and in that. And, and that will really, really help you focus your efforts, especially for those of you who are very busy with uh, side jobs and stuff. Okay, so yeah, uh, advanced interview course version two, sim preparation courses we talked about. And then there's the gold package, which includes AI CV2, uh, sim preparation course and CV cover letter course, which is probably the best deal that we have with, of course, the platinum package that comes at a further discount. 
Good. Um, so you can join our WhatsApp group if you are not there yet. But what's the most active for us is Discord. There's a lot, a lot going on in Discord at the moment. So go and come and join us inside Discord. It will be a pleasure to speak to you. This is where I go. If you want to contact me uh, directly, you can. I go on Discord. I struggle to reply to WhatsApps, but I reply to Discords. I try my best. Of course, ask your questions, please, in the group first if your question could be useful to others. And then, uh, and, and we've got some very active members that, that help out as well. Okay, you can download our app as well, but if you do, please, if you make a purchase, make it from the website, because otherwise we'll just lose control of what goes on with you as a client if, you, uh, if you've got problems and you have to deal with Apple, which, which is fine, but the best is to go through the website and after that access through the app. It was a pleasure to do this presentation for you, and I hope that you learned everything that you needed to learn uh, on low-cost Irish airline and um, that all this content was useful to you. Come and see us on Discord, uh, you can subscribe and like the channel, it will be a pleasure to get to see you again.